you want to take your Bibles out, and turn to Matthew chapter 23. Matthew 23, starting at verse 13. This is known as the seven woes passage. Matthew 23, starting at verse 13. This is Jesus talking. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. Woe to you, blind guides! You say if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, he is bound by his oath. You blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But if anyone swears by the gift on it, he is bound by his oath. You blind men, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Therefore, he who swears by the altar swears by it, and by everything on it. And he who swears by the temple swears by it, and by the one who dwells in it. And he who swears by heaven swears by God's throne, and the one who sits on it. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You build tombs for the prophets and decorate the graves of the righteous, and you say, If we had lived in the days of our forefathers, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are the descendants of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of the sin of your forefathers. We'll stop there. There's some some of the harshest words that Jesus ever spoke. Now, just some brief background here. Pharisees and teachers of the law. The Pharisees were a group who wanted to follow the Old Testament law closely against all the influences of the Greeks and the Romans. So, at the time of Jesus, Israel had been conquered many times. They had been conquered by the Greeks, and then they were conquered by the Romans, And so there were all these other influences. So there were all these Greek culture influences, and then there were these Roman cultural influences, and it was kind of polluting people's observance of the law and following God. And so there were these people called the Pharisees who said, okay, we've got way too much worldly influences on us. We got to get back to what the Bible says, and we got to follow it. And we got to follow it to the letter. That's what God wants. Not, not so bad. And so Pharisees weren't, weren't as much of, um, weren't, they weren't as much of a, an exclusive group as they were a, a tradition of thought. So, um, like for example, um, an Amish person. It's not, like, it's not like there's just one group of Amish. There's quite a few different groups of Amish people. And you can, you can always tell them they, they stand out from, from society. And they've, 
they've kind of made a decision that they are not going to be subject to all of the influences of the world. And there's nothing wrong with that. And then it says teachers of the law. In uh, the literal Greek translation is, is scribes. These people are, are the ones who transcribed the Bible and made additional copies of it. So they're, they're scribes. And they were people who made new copies of Scripture and they also taught it to others. So they were scribes, so they made new copies of Scripture, but they also were the ones who knew the Bible better than anybody else. And so they would be kind of like the pastors of the time because they knew the Bible best. So you would not want to be a, a, a pastor at the time of Jesus and be hearing these kinds of things. It's kind of, uh, kind of scary. Now, both of these groups of people, they, there was a lot of overlap. There were a lot of scribes who were Pharisees and so forth. Both had to know a lot about what the Bible said. You, you couldn't be one of these people and not know what the Bible said. So these, these are the people who knew the Bible better than anybody else. And there were so many rules. I mean, the Old Testament is, is huge. I mean, as you, as you know, and not only is the Old Testament huge, but they had this whole nother set of rules about how to follow those rules. Because these, these Old Testament rules were given to when the people were wandering in the desert. So since we're not wandering in the desert anymore, there's all these different situations that we're now in. So there's all these rules about how to follow those rules. And so you had to know, like, this much of stuff and you had to follow it all and so pharisees and teachers of the law scribes they were they were the ones who knew all of this they were they were the ones who they were they were knowledgeable and they were they were disciplined and they kind of stood out from everybody else because they knew what the right thing to do was in all circumstances whereas most people they knew most of the laws, but not all of them, and so they, you know, they wouldn't be following everything all the time. And one more thing about the two of them. Both of them sacrificed a lot to follow this big set of rules. They, they made some big sacrifices. They, they had to stand out from the crowd. They had to, they had to look weird. They had to act different than everybody else. So, again, like Amish people today, you can recognize an Amish person just by looking at them because they stand out. They have to make a lot of sacrifices to live the way that they do. And I'm not saying that Amish people are Pharisees, but I'm saying it's, it's kind of like that. And Amish people are looked at as as people who you respect because they're, they've made huge sacrifices to live the way that they do. And it's very respectable that somebody would live that way on, on principle like that. And so Pharisees were, were respected. If for no other reason than, hey, these people are giving up a lot just so that they can live this way because they want to follow the Scripture. And so, Jesus saying all these scary things about them, that, that's, that'd be really eye-opening. That, that's, that's really surprising. What's more surprising is that of all of the Jewish groups at this time, there were Pharisees, there were Sadducees, there were Essenes, there were Zealots, there were Herodians, there were a bunch of different groups of all of them the Pharisees were the ones that Jesus would have agreed with the most. If you looked at everything that they believed, the Pharisees would have had more in common with Jesus than any of those other groups. Any of those other religious groups. There, there were a bunch of things they had in common. For example, the Pharisees thought that the whole Old Testament was inspired Scripture. 
Most other Jewish groups, they thought it was just the first five books. So Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, that's it. Whereas the Pharisees said, no, the, the Psalms, the prophets, the, those are all scripture too. So they had the same scripture. Um, the Pharisees were kind of, kind of uh, unique and they believed in the resurrection of the dead. You know, in our Apostles' Creed, we say we believe in the resurrection of the body. You know, Jesus believed that. The Pharisees believed that. Most other Jews didn't believe that at that time. And the Pharisees were people who advocated equality and they hung out with regular people. There were the Sadducees and they were mostly people who were priests in the temple and they did their, they were kind of the ivory tower people who they just kind of were in the temple. They did their temple sacrifices. They kind of thought that they were better than everybody else because they were in these positions and they were wealthy and and everything like that. The Pharisees, they were, they were around the regular people. And they, they even gave money to the poor. They, they were generous. I mean, Jesus even says that. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin. It, they, they, they gave money to the poor. So people saw them as, as you know, they're, they're, not, they're not these people in this ivory tower. They're people, you know, who are among us. And Jesus was like that too. He didn't just go, he wasn't just in the temple. He was out with all these different kinds of people. You know, he was hanging out with lepers and prostitutes, tax collectors and such. And Jesus gave his most intense rebukes against them. The, the, the harshest, scariest things that Jesus ever said were against these people. That's kind of sobering. These were the people who were looking to follow the Bible more than anybody else, making big sacrifices to do it. They agreed with Jesus on almost, on, well, almost everything, a lot of things, and Jesus had his scariest stuff to say to them. Not against the tax collectors, not against the prostitutes, not against murderers. It was against the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. If you have your Bibles, verses 15 through 22. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. When he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as you are. And then... If you say anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But if you swear by the gold of the temple, then you're bound by your oath. And then if you swear by the altar, that doesn't mean anything. But if you swear by what's on the altar, the gift on it, then you're bound by your oath. And Jesus is like, okay, how does that make sense? What happened? They reduced God to a long list of technicalities and do's and don'ts. All God cares about is all of these lists of do's and don'ts. And it's this very technical list to the point where if you swear by the altar, then it doesn't mean anything. If you say, I promise by the altar that I will be there tomorrow at this time, you don't have to be there at that time. But if you say, I, I promise by what's on the altar that I will be there tomorrow at this time, then you have to go. Okay, what's more important, the, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Long list of technicalities and just do's and don'ts. When we make God into a list of just, you do this, you don't do that, we really lose what the whole point of God really is. I mean, yeah, there are things that we need to do. There are things that we need not to do. But if that's all that God is, then really, we're just a religion. We're just another religion. Verses 23 and 24. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin. In other words, what they would do is, 
I mean, they, they didn't have like paychecks like we do, but they would be able to get all different kinds of things. So they would have they would have food that they would get. They would have spices and other things, and they would tithe absolutely everything that they had, even their spices, their mint, dill, and cumin. They would they would take a tenth off of absolutely everything. They gave to the poor, but not out of justice or mercy. They would, ne- they would give to the poor, but they would neglect the reasons for giving to the poor. Justice, mercy, faithfulness. It's not that they cared about the poor. They were looking to just jump through the hoops that God gave them to jump through. And in that way, I'm doing what God wants me to do. I give to the poor, I give a tenth, and therefore I'm doing what God wants me to do. Halo. That's the way they thought. And 25 through 28. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. Can you imagine having a cup that looks good on the outside, but then when you look inside, it's nasty? Like it hasn't been washed in years? Would you want to drink out of that cup? Yeah, exactly. What was going on? They were only jumping through hoops. So on the outside, they were doing all the right things. They, they, they looked good on the outside. They did all the right stuff. They were doing all the do's and don'ts. They were following that really well. On the inside, though, they didn't really care about any of that stuff. They were just earning their, their ticket to heaven. They were earning God's approval. God likes me because I do this, this, and this, and this. All God cares about is what I do. That's it. God's not like a person or anything like that. He just, he just is mechanical and wants us to just do these things. And the problem is this. The, last, the fourth kind of fake faith that we'll talk about They were self-righteous. They were good by their own standards, but not God's. They were good by their own standards and not God's. And this is a temptation for all of us. Because it's very easy to confuse what we think God wants with what God actually wants. It's very easy to how how you might put it this way, to make God in our image. So if if, if we read something in the Bible that doesn't really jive with the way we feel things are, we might just kind of skip over that part. Or we might just say, eh, that was just for back then, we don't have to worry about that. Or, yeah, that was just, that was just Matthew talking. That wasn't God. That was just his opinion. And we, can, we have these ways of doing that. They were good by their own standards, but not God's. And the trick is to learn when our minds are saying, um, let's just skip over that part. And to be like, wait a minute. God might actually be saying something here, and I might not like it, but that doesn't mean that I can just gloss over it. Look at the screen here with me, if you would, and answer the question, why can't the good that we do make us right with God, or at least help make us right with Him? Because the righteousness which can pass God's scrutiny must be entirely perfect and must in every way measure up to the divine law. Even the very best we do in this life is imperfect and stained with sin. Because because we're born into sin, we have this sin nature, 
And because we have this sin nature, there's, there's this selfishness in us. There's this pride in us. And even the best of us in this room here right now still have traces of selfishness and pride in us. And so, when we're even doing our best things, there's still a part of us that just wants to be good. That wants to be looked on as good. That wants to maybe just win God's favor. Or wants to feel better about ourselves. Because sometimes when you do good deeds, you feel better about yourself. And so, there's always these mixed motives within us. And so, being self-righteous is an ultimate deception. So how do you determine really righteous from self-righteous? Well, in my long, long 36 years of living, I've uh, come to realize some different things about what might be self-righteous and what's really righteous. So I'll, I'll just uh, give you some things for you to chew on. You, you can uh, take it for what it's worth. A self-righteous person thinks, I'm right. I'm right. A self-righteous person is actually more interested in being right than knowing the truth. A self-righteous person will start with the assumption, I'm right. A really righteous person will say something like, I'm not right, Jesus is right. It's not me who's right, it's Jesus who's right. And I do my best to follow him, but if I'm right, it's not because of me, it's not because I'm smart, it's not because I'm anything special, it's because I'm, I'm listening to someone who is right. It's not me. So a self-righteous person would say, listen to me, take my word for it. A really righteous person will say, don't listen to me, listen to God. A self-righteous person will think to themselves, they probably wouldn't put this into words, but they'll probably think to themselves, I follow the better, Bible better than anybody else. I follow the Bible better than others. I've got it. I've got it straight. Other people, they're overlooking things. They're the ones who are missing parts and they're reading into it. But when I read the Bible, I'm just reading it for what it really says and and I I've, I've got it down. And everybody really should just listen to me. I used to think that way, by the way. The really righteous people will say, I follow the Bible, but I'm always learning from others. In other words, other Christians, people who have other gifts. People who say, hey, you know, I noticed that, that uh, you do this. Do you really think that's what God wants you to do? And instead of being like, well, well... Let me find a verse that, that will, will defend what, what I do here. You know, it's, oh, well, let me think about that. Let me pray about that. Maybe, maybe you're right about that. Instead of just dismissing it right off the bat. A self-righteous person will excuse their faults on technicalities. They'll, they'll find ways to... To justify what they do. So back the, the Pharisees, for example, they what they would do is they had these 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 huge set of rules, right? Well, Jesus at one point said, Why do you break the command of God, the one that's actually in the Bible, for the sake of your laws here? Because in the Bible it says, honor your father and mother. But you say that if there's somebody who has parents who need help, because there were no social security back then, you had to take care of your parents. 
If, you, if there was somebody whose parents needed help, they were getting old, they couldn't work anymore, and they needed to eat and not live on the street, that you say that there's a, a, a loophole there so somebody can say, everything that I might otherwise give to you is a gift devoted to God, so I don't have to give you anything. So you are nullifying the word of God for the sake of your tradition. They had that loophole there. So you could be, you could be, have, have parents back then and be a Pharisee and say, Mom and Dad, you know what? You're old. You, you've lived your time in life. I don't, and I don't care if you're going hungry or not. Just... I'm, I'm keeping the money that I have for myself. I'm not going to help you out. And you would be perfectly fine within their, their set of laws. A self-righteous person would feel they need to make you to be like them. A self-righteous person will go more than just say, okay, you need to follow Jesus. They, they will want you to be like them all the way down. So, for example, there was a day when I was younger and a little more immature when um, I was trying to witness to certain friends, and I thought that, they had to be like me, that being a Christian means doing everything that I did. So not only did they have to follow Jesus, but I would say that you also have to be CRC, you have to be a Republican, you have to be homeschooling, you can only listen to Christian music, and you cannot do this, this, or this, and this on Sunday. So everything that I was, they had to be. A really righteous person would feel the need to share Christ and then let the Spirit do the rest. The really righteous care that you know Christ, that you're following Him. Not that you are going to be a carbon copy of them. And the really righteous people, actually, they're not the ones who are trying, they don't try to change you, usually. Usually. They will want to witness to you and tell you about Jesus, but they're not going to be the ones who are trying to pressure you into anything. And finally, just a summary. The self-righteous are confident in themselves. They're confident in their own understanding, their own way of doing things. They're confident in themselves. The really righteous are confident in Christ. Christ did it all. Christ is it all. And he's the one. He's where all the confidence is. So are you confident in yourself? What you do, how you do it, how you read the Bible, how you live the Christian life, or are you confident in Jesus Christ and are looking to follow him in all that you do. Let's bow our heads and let's pray about it. Lord God in heaven, it's easy for us to be self-righteous, to think that we have a, a corner on truth and on what it means to be a Christian. We pray that we wouldn't be that way. We pray that we would look to your son, Jesus Christ, that, Lord, he would define everything that it means and that we would point people to him and that we would let your spirit take over, that we wouldn't try to change other people, but that we would let you change them and that we would just be walking, witnessing examples of who you are, your love, your goodness, and your justice. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.